Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you have entered the world of the Los Angeles Bushwick Book Club. Who are we? What do we do? Did you find yourself here on purpose by accident? Well, let me tell you, we are a group of songwriters that meet once a month, read the same book, and then write an original song inspired by that book. Uh, the Bushwick Book Club was started in 2009 by Susan Huang, who is actually on the show tonight, but not as a performer. She is in our Zoom backstage, uh, controlling everything. She's making us show up and sing and all the good technical stuff that needs to happen. But she started this in Bushwick, Brooklyn, hence the name Bushwick Book Club, even though we're in Los Angeles. And I loved the process as a songwriter so much that when I moved begrudgingly, but now I, I like it here to Los Angeles, I the first thing I did was start this book club. And for a long time, we would just be in my yard and we finally moved on and gained the courage to go to live spaces. And then when the pandemic hit, we have moved to the live stream platform, which is kind of cool because we can reach more people. But if you Google the Bushwick Book Club, you will find that there are chapters all over the world. So there could be one in your town if you are not in LA right now. Uh, so this month, our book is The Life of the Mind by Christine Smallwood. Uh, we actually have Christine on the show today and I'm super excited. She is going to be uh, interviewed Q and A with one of our songwriters and I'm very excited to hear what she has to say about the book because I really enjoyed reading it and I had lots of song ideas. Um, so this book is a pretty cerebral novel about the character Dorothy and it starts off with a miscarriage that Dorothy has, but that's not really the, the center stage of the story. It doesn't take center stage. Really, it's just all the things that are happening in her mind as she moves through the process of going through this miscarriage, but also many other things in her life. And it, I mean, it's the life of the mind and she's got a lot of life in that mind. And I think we can all relate because a, a lot of it is about her inner critic and her self doubt. And I, you know, maybe you don't have that, I have that. If you don't have it, I'd love to know how you don't have it. Dorothy copes with it because she has two therapists and that's, I mean, it's probably a good idea. I should probably get one, at least start there and then possibly get two. But enough about me. I would like to introduce our 10 songwriters. We have 10 songwriters here today. They have all read this book and written a song that was inspired by it. And you know, this process is, it's a process. We're performing for you, but it's really about the process of being inspired by somebody else's creativity to come up with our own creativity, our own little baby of whatever it is and uh, present it to you in whatever form it exists on the day that we schedule the show. So some of these songwriters have maybe written the, the song a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, and some of them might have written it an hour ago. We don't know, it's their process, but it's really fun to watch and I'm really glad that you're here to do that with us. So before I introduce the first songwriter, I'm just gonna let you know how our show is gonna run today because we have the author Christine Smallwood with us. We have a couple song breaks where we'll be interviewing her and then she'll be reading from the book. So we've got three songwriters and then the interview between one of our songwriters and Christine, then four songwriters, then a reading with Christine, and then we'll end with three more songs. That's it, that's what we're doing. That's what we're here to do and I, am ready to start this show with Molly White, who is a longtime Los Angeles Bushwick booker. And here she is. Take it away, Molly. Hello. Thank you, Stacy. It's so fun to be back. Um, I read most of this book. I didn't read the whole thing. And I was inspired by two phrases. One phrase um, 
is it's kind of random, but they brought something up in me. Um, one was um, the phrase passed down like the squeeze of a hand when uh, this character Dorothy is sitting in a subway and she sees um, a homeless person walking through the subway and everybody kind of puts their headphones on like the squeeze of a hand down the whole row. Um, that to me was interesting because it signifies some kind of like passage of time. And then I took it in another direction. So this song is called um, A Moment in Time. I also thought that she was afraid to kind of experience her present. Um, and the second thing that inspired me was um, she says it was the closest quote. It was the closest she got to living in the moment, reliving moments she had lived before. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, here's someone in her head all the time. She's having a hard time being present. Um, so I kind of put those two things together and made this song. Isn't it just like a dream? My feet don't touch the ground. Things aren't what they seem. Ghosts are all around. A Rube Goldberg invention. Rolling balls and springs. Hanging in suspension. Tied up. And that and you 
you had such a positive spin about being um, caught in your mind. I like that. I guess I think I always think of it as sort of a negative thing. Like if you're caught in your mind, it's, but you had a lot of positivity in that. And that was a lot of uh, cool uh, section changes and a super cool background <laughs> that fit perfectly with your song. So awesome. Thank you, Molly White. Uh, up next, we have William Bloat. Hello. I found this book difficult, <laughs> um, but I got through it, and it was very interesting because when I finished the book, I actually felt angry, and I thought, what's that about? And um, I think what that's about is just how much the self-obsession of, of Dorothy uh, reminds me of myself, <laughs> and so it was very, uh, very good. I, I, I think you're an excellent writer, Christina, and I look forward to your future work. William 
the load. That was great. Once again, lots of movements to the, yeah, the yeah. start. I love that. Dun, 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 dun. I know. The band, the band should have been here, you know, what can I say? I was thinking, and this might date me a little bit, I was like, I kind of want to hear Dix play the song. You know, they were so dramatic, and they had all these dramatic, like, especially the Mr. Roboto album, but they had yeah. all these these albums that they did that just like were huge pieces that I think people really just knew the Mr. Roboto song, but all of the, and they were such great vocalists and could really like capture yeah. the drama of all those movements. So awesome. Thank you so much. Thank William. You. All right. Next we have a new performer. He has never performed. I don't think he's performed with the Bushwick book club at all. I mean, he's performed, I've seen his studio. You will see his studio. He is a performer, but I don't think he's performed with the Bushwick Book Club. Definitely not with the Los Angeles Bushwick Book Club. So our next performer, I welcome him for the first time to Los Angeles Bushwick Book Club is Blanco and Junk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm excited and nervous to be here, but uh, I just wanted to say that I did in enjoy the book, although at the end I really did not like Dorothy and uh, similar to William I just uh realized shortly after I finished the book that uh that uh, she reminded me of me so uh this is called if if I'm just there <clears throat> I live alone inside my head even though I deal with others constantly Oh, I'm okay But I don't care I mean, I do I just can't let you see The little dance Inside my mind And the empty space between A to B You can't begin To understand And if you did You wouldn't talk to me Someday soon I'll take control Or maybe I just want you to bleed Let inertia take a hold And take away what's left of me Not in the mood talk about what has transpired or what's happening because if I stop to look around the truth will twist in the unraveling oh yeah I'm all right yeah I'm fine but I'd feel better if I had a drink something strong to wash it down the last thing I want to do when this stall is thing Control, or maybe I just want to bleed. Let inertia take a hold and take away what's left of me. If I just show up. And do what's expected of me If I'm just there Will they know who I am? Will they even care? Nobody gives a damn It's the karma of karaoke singing someone else's words in a darkened room the days go by and i forget what the hell it is that i want to do the end is near so they say well the kids will blame you for it anyway even in my dreams the guilt remains 
It's the same in my state of need. Someday soon I take control. Or maybe I just watch it bleed. Let inertia take a hold and take away what's left of me. Watch it bleed. Let inertia take a hold and take away what's left of me. Take away what's left of me. Take away what's left of me. One part of your song, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna remember the the actual verse, but it it. I kept thinking, oh, this is like a teacher's lament. Like it, it just had this moment of like standing in front of people, being like, oh, "It's got to be me because you're not paying attention." I don't know. I had that moment. I don't know if it's in there. <laughs> but I, had, I was like I should probably uh, get a glass of whiskey and re-listen to this song in a, a dark room. I love your vocal quality. We're so glad to have you on you. our show and part of our songwriter group now. I hope you will continue to do this with us. Would love to, would love to, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, so that's our the first three songwriters we're going to have. And now we're going to do something um, a little different, but we've done it before. We've had uh, authors on the show before. But this is, uh, I, I believe it's Christine Smallwood's debut novel. So this is really fun. And I think we're kind of kicking off her big tour of, of, um, of her talking about her book on all kinds of uh, podcasts, which must be interesting because it's very different than probably releasing your first book, not in a pandemic. So... Um, so we're doing something different too. Usually I interview or Q and A with the, the authors. I'm okay at it, I'm all right. But we have Nicole Tortolo, who is one of our, there's a motorcycle over there. Nicole Tortolo, who is one of our songwriters, is she also works in publishing and brought Christine's book to us. So we thought it would be fun if Nicole did the interview. So welcome Nicole. And welcome, Christine. We're so excited to have you here and share these songs with you. Hi, Christine. Hi, Nicole. Thanks, Stacy. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, everyone. This is so amazing and wonderful and um, surreal. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, this must, must be a strange experience yeah yeah it's really cool like i hope everybody has i wish all authors could have this experience it's very very cool <laughs> that's so nice i have to tell you i absolutely loved your book i sped through it it was just it wouldn't let me go um and i've recommended it to so many people so i just i thank you it was such a treat sometimes i get into these places where i read a couple books that aren't that inspiring. I'm like, maybe I don't like fiction. And then I read your book. I was like, no, I like fiction. I just need great fiction. Oh. So thank you for writing such a wonderful book. Thank you. It's um, really nice. So the first line in this book, I mean, talk about, talk about a showstopper. I'm going to read it for you all. So if there are kids listening, cover their ears. <laughs> Dorothy was taking a shit at the library when her therapist called and she let it go to voicemail. So I was so curious about this line and whether, you know, you wrote this line first, if you wrote this line later, was this always the first line of the book? Because it's fantastic. Oh, well, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so the book started as a short story and it was always the first line of the short story. And um, then when I decided to try to go back to the story to see if I could expand it into a longer narrative, it I just kind of 
kept writing from the end of the story. And, you know, it eventually went back and had to do like a bunch of revision and move things around. But the, the first few sentences, I think, never, never changed. That makes sense because they're so good. I feel like there are <laughs> certain things are just they, they were always meant to be. And that's what this first line feels like. Um, so you, you answered a little bit of my second question, which was about your process. Um, I think if you asked the songwriters in this group how we write songs, whether it's, you know, the lyrics first, the melody first, you'd get as many answers as you have songwriters and, and songs come in different ways. But um, it's interesting that this started as a short story and, and became a novel. Was it difficult to to expand it? Did this uh, novel take a long time to write or was it sort of like a quick fever dream experience? It didn't feel like it was quick. Um, when I went back to the story and really was like, okay, I'm gonna work on this now as a novel. I think it was about 18 months between starting that and selling it and then another 18 months. And I did a fair amount of revision after selling it. So it was really like three years of work um, but the story I did write kind of all at once, more or less as it, as it was, which is pretty um, strange for me because I tend to be like writing involves a lot of work and rewriting for me. I'm really not the kind of person who just sits down, writes a draft and is then like, I'm done. It's a lot of throwing stuff away. And so when I went back to the story, it was I mean, just like I don't know how many books were thrown out along the way that just you know didn't work. That's inspiring. I, I feel like people don't know how how much revision, how much writing is truly revision and how great books are, are really made great in the revision. You know, of course, you start with good material, but yeah, I mean, just like throwing out tons of stuff that just wasn't working. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, one of the things I liked best about Dorothy, who was, you know, a really great character to follow. Um, is that she's just endlessly interesting. I, I loved how compelling she was. And I kept thinking to myself as I was following her through this and, and really curious the next thing she would have to, that she would be thinking about. I didn't always like her. And, and I, I love that because I think there's a particular pressure on women, whether female writers or female characters to be likable in order to be interesting. And I wonder, you know, do you personally think about whether your characters are likable? And um, is that something that we ask of women more than men? I mean, yes, we definitely ask that of women more than men. No, I didn't think, I just didn't really think about whether or not she was likable. Um, it didn't really, I mean, I was aware that I didn't want someone to hate her so much that they would put the book down after five pages. But I sort of felt like if you got through the first chapter with her, you were probably like going to see her through to the end. But I have a question for you, which is what don't you like about her? Well, it's interesting because a couple songwriters have introed saying, you know, they felt this like irritation towards her. And it's like, you know, that's me. That's the, the, the parts of, of Dorothy that I find the hardest to look at are the parts of myself that yeah. I think are the hardest to look at. And, um, you know, she, I don't think it's, it's a question of whether she's like moral or immoral or anything like that, but there are times when you just want her to like take a bath <laughs> and like yeah. have, a, have a night of rest from right. this kind of um, circular thinking. I think that's what it is. It's like, oh gosh, you're me. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, like I was, the book is really for me about, it's about shame. And so like, I wanted to like lean in and, and run towards whatever was like the most shameful. Right. And so I think that, you know, often we do feel angry about things that we, that, that make us feel shame or icky or whatever, or cringy. I mean, like I definitely had early readers told me that they found her very like cringy and, um, to be perfectly honest that I, I never really felt that way. I, she never made me cringe, but I knew that she was saying all of the things and I was allowing her to air in public a lot of things that are very cringy and, and shame inducing. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that really came through. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, while I was reading this book, I wasn't, I often pick things up and put them down and read other things. I work in publishing, so I'm always reading manuscripts. Um, but with your book, I was really in it for, uh, all I read was this while I was reading it, 
which um, was a treat, but also I started to think even more like Dorothy. I think that was also an aspect of it that um, that I found unnerving, an aspect of, of being with her, because she has these like obsessive, um, you know, thought patterns. And I'm wondering if you felt that while writing it. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a really hard question. I. I definitely, I mean, I think probably this is the first book I've written. So I don't really know what writing a book is like. I only know what writing this book was like. And I definitely felt like I was like in its climate the whole time I was working on it. And I was pretty miserable, you know, <laughs> like, I was pretty, um, and it's hard to say, you know, like, why, why is that? Is that because of the, the fear that it's not going well? Or is it because actually you're in a kind of space that is a kind of miserable, circular, obsessive space? I don't, I don't really have anything to compare it to. Um, but I totally lost track of your question. Can you ask it again? No, you, you, I was just saying, like, where, did you find yourself in her mental space? Oh, but yeah, definitely. And I definitely like at times would feel like an intense identification with her and then would kind of remember that actually I'm not really like her at all. <laughs> and just kind of, I, but I assume that that happens with all the time, you know, and maybe even the songwriters who are here tonight, like have those feelings about the characters that they, they use in their songs. And it's just that kind of push pull when you're working in a, a different voice that isn't identified as your voice. Yeah. Um, so you talked about the long timeline of, of a book, you know, it, it, you, you handed this in presumably like, like a year ago or, or at least six months. I handed it in like, like totally finished. You mean yeah, like to my editor? Yeah. In the fall. Yeah. In the fall. So it, uh, there's this quote that I love and I think it's Ian McEwen, but I, I'm trusting Mary Carr tweeting that it was Ian McEwen. So it could have been someone else, but. I think he said, you know, that being on book tour is like being an employee of your former self because you're not the person that you were when you wrote the book. You, you've grown and changed. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way at all? Well, I don't, I mean, not yet because I haven't done enough book. I haven't had this conversation enough times to like, but, but cause this is, I'm still just sort of exploring the weirdness of even talking about it at all. But yeah, I definitely think that, you know, I wrote the book to, exercise certain things for my own psyche probably right or I was there's certain questions I felt really preoccupied with or that seemed really alive to me and those questions do feel a little bit not as interesting to me anymore just because I spent three years really thinking about them and now I'm kind of ready to think about something else so yeah I, I think that's fair and probably common yeah <laughs> um so, you know, Dorothy is struggling in her career in academia, and I know you got a PhD in English mm -hmm. from Columbia, um, mm -hmm. and you now work as an essayist and a journalist, and now, of course, a novelist. Do you, is there anything about academia that you miss? Oh, yeah, tons of things. I mean, I think academia can be, I mean, I, I, yes, I mean, teaching is wonderful. You know, the opportunity to be with young people you know, and be around young people, I think is incredibly energizing and important. And as you know, the older I get, the more I can understand why people want, want to teach. Um, the opportunity to read seriously, to read deeply, to be around colleagues who are really smart, who are really thinking about things. Like all of that I think is great. Um, the profession itself, I think can be, you know, quite ugly or, I mean, the book, the book is about all of the sort of ugliness and precarity and contingency and exploitation and all of that. But yeah, I definitely think there are good things about academia. Yeah. And I love the way that you, you really show us how you can be devoted, the character devoted to this thing, but there just not be a way to make money. <laughs> so I think yeah. you academia or art many forms of art it's you know it's this balance between like how do I make a living right? yeah I mean that is the question that all of us have to confront <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um well, thank you so much it's wonderful to have you here and thank you again for writing this book thank you and thank you to I mean everyone this is so wonderful I'm really grateful Thank you, Nicole and Christine. Oh man, that was that was fascinating. Uh, I definitely picked up on the. She has a couple chapters where she really talks about shame, and now that you brought it up again, I I wish I would have written my song. 
about that <laughs> because she has some poignant things to say about that. And I got a little bit more fixated on her, her apocalypse and her teaching sort of subject. But also what you said, Christine, about um, if you got through chapter one, you were probably going to stick with her. And that did that exact thing. You know your book because <laughs> that exact thing happened to me. I was reading it and I was like, I, I don't think I've ever read a book like this. It was kind of a new genre for me. I don't know what genre it is because, you know, I'm a musician and I'm not in publish. I don't know if it has a specific genre, but I did when I got through the first chapter, I was kind of addicted to her and I did like her and I felt like I was watching a a movie where you just want them to tell the truth. Like if you just tell everybody what's going on, they'll help you, <laughs> like, but she won't tell anybody. So that aspect of her brought a lot of suspense for me. It was almost like I just wanted, is she, she gonna like bring in somebody to help her through this? But she just kind of stayed all up in here, even when her, her friend, kind of confides in her about what she's because she doesn't really tell, she doesn't tell the truth about it. And it's a moment where I guess people could see that as possibly not likable. But to me, it was just like, ah, it's like a free pass to just oh, let it all out. Anyway, that's uh, Nicole. Thank you so much for for doing that and having those questions you're hired. <laughs> Every single time we have an author on, you are on. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're gonna. So, and thank you, Christine Smallwood, and we'll bring her back on, and she's gonna read from the book. So we're gonna have four more songwriters. Uh, up next for your enjoyment is the fabulous Rupert Angel Eyes. You, 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 you. Oh, can you hear me? Hopefully you can. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I love that interview, uh, Christine. Uh, the way that you said how you took some short stories and um, threaded them all together, I definitely felt that in the book. Uh, when I was writing the song and reading your book, um, I definitely felt like there was a short story of you going to Las Vegas and hanging out with your mentor and like the feeling of realizing that your mentor like you have your uh you have your uh accolades in uh academia and suddenly your mentor isn't um the mentor they are like the peer i thought about that a lot and um yes at the last chapter of the book or towards the end of the book when uh you talk about um singing karaoke and um, talking to people, and you reference esoteric books and artwork, you know, and people's eyes just, just like glaze over when you're at, like at a party, you know. Um, those definitely felt like two short stories that you made into a novel. Um, so my lyrics were referencing both uh, your time in Las Vegas with your mentor and also um, karaoke uh, with Gabby. I thought a lot about Gabby. I feel like you kind of, uh, yeah, you kind of take a shit on Gabby, but um, I think she was just trying to deal with her own things in her own way, and that's very difficult. Um, I also tried to relate to this book in that, like many songwriters and many people, I often live uh, my own intimate uh, life in my mind and um, it is comforting and I have a beautiful life in my mind, but it also feels isolating at the same time. It feels lonely at the same time. Um, yeah, so my lyrics are just a, a smattering of the parts that I enjoyed about your book. Uh, it was a wonderful book and it goes a little bit something like this. Misery. I ref 
children's books, but no one cares the mystery. What will I find in my underwear? Probes me about my health. Little Yoki, and I suppose I have to say, I'm trying, but not at all. What was his name? I was a That's the hook right there. That's the hit. <laughs> that is the hit. <laughs> I, you have this talent of just taking things directly from the book, like several lines directly from the book, and making it like this song that can exist on its own. Because I think sometimes with this process, you'll you'll either write something that the the book sparks something you were maybe gonna that's been sitting in you for a while, or. Uh, a new perspective or something and you don't necessarily take directly from the book as some people do or there's like exact lines and then like one line will spark you or the title itself or whatever but you have this way of taking like all kinds of things popping them in there and then they sound like a song that can exist all on their own like the underwear line I mean there, there's no reference unless you've read the if you've read the book you know exactly what you're referencing but it sits on its own and makes complete sense without reading the book at the therapist yeah 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 just trying to capture like the general feel of the book you know and like not zooming in too closely about things yeah uh, like an impressionistic paste painting or something you know it's great i i love it like, you know, i can definitely relate to um having two therapists at the same time it's a cardinal <laughs> sin as far as therapists go but i've been there and uh definitely related to that as well yeah thank you for writing this book that was Rupert Angel Eyes, everyone. I am sitting in this new fabulous position because I am up next. After this, I will be able to breathe properly. Um, so here, does everybody hear reverb? That's my, my cue that I've got the sound on right. Okay, one minute. I, 
You know, I read this book and I really enjoyed it. And just like Nicole, I kind of didn't put it down once I started. I, I was really interested in finishing. And it, part of it was that suspense of, is she just going to like, is she going to get out of her head and like pull somebody else in? But she, to, to me, she just didn't seem to do that. So when I reached the end of the book, so much had happened that all of a sudden I was like, what, what? I, I don't need, I didn't make notes and sometimes I make notes and I just, because I enjoyed reading it, I was reading it all the, in the bathtub, in a hammock and I, and I just didn't have my notes with me. And I couldn't really remember any, like all of a sudden I didn't remember any of it and there was an assignment at the end for uh, the, Dorothy gives her students an assignment to write about the end. And I thought, okay, well, I'll do that. <laughs> and I will just follow her assignment. And I, I think it, it, it brings the, it, it's definitely inspired by the book, but also my thoughts about the end. It, I've been thinking about when things end quite a bit and wanted to write a song about it. I'm not sure if this is quite the one I wanted to write, but I was thinking about, do you know when the last time you get on like a bicycle is? Like, do you know that? There's my camera over there. Do you know that? I don't know. I mean, I think maybe some one day you just don't get on one again, and that's just the last time you oh, the last time you kiss somebody, and then like you break up. You're like, oh, well, would it, the kiss have been different if maybe you knew you were going to break up the next day? <laughs> I don't know. So these are these things that have been going through my head, and I wanted to write a song. This is not quite it, but I'm very thankful that this pushed me in the direction to really start thinking about this. So this is the assignment that Dorothy gave her students. I need water.
Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, Justine Cragen, the beautiful Justine Cragen, you are on. Thank you, Stacy. That was a beautiful song. Everyone, you interview everyone after their songs, but who's there for you? Um, it was really gorgeous. I loved it. Um, so I enjoyed this book and um, I found Dorothy's thoughts pretty entertaining and often relatable. Um, a couple of things that I that stood out, her waking fantasy of, dy of the dystopian future, um, where she's answering to future generations for her lack of um, action for the world. And um, I really enjoyed, there were a lot of phrases that I wrote down that I, what, that I thought were really interesting and poetic. Like she lived in an epilogue of wants was one of them. And I liked her musings on the end of email and how when you send a long email, it's actually an act of aggression. <laughs> I thought it was really funny. There were a lot of parts where I laughed, um, especially at her experience with Keith and not only the experience that she had with him, but of how she analyzed it and afterwards and thought of how, what did I, how did I, how did he perceive me to think that I wanted this treatment? Um, I just thought it was really funny. I laughed out loud for real. And, um, I also just appreciated the balance of her philosophical brain being really busy and then how, you know, she has a brain, but she also lives in a body and she's dealing with the mundanity of like daily life and the weight of the world. Um, and in the face of all that, how do you protect your own vulnerability um, when you're when you're experiencing constant external inputs of modern society? So I was sort of thinking along those lines when I wrote this book. And I wanted to, since Dorothy has a lot of dialogue in her head, I wanted to write a song with like a lot of words um, to kind of reflect that. So um, let's see how, how it goes. It's all too much to try to clutch a house of sand and find it slipping through your hand despite the force of your command, the end is near. And like the shifting of a gear, a future previously clear recedes into a distant year. What can we bear to refuse inside these postmodern blues? We're on display and in an extraordinary way. So excuse me while I stay inside a harbor of okay. It's no surprise that when I look into your eyes, I see a glimmer of the prize before we hide behind our lies. What do we dare to misuse inside these postmodern blues? Try to clutch a house of sand and find it slipping through your hand Despite the force of your command, the end is near And like the shifting of a gear, a future previously clear Recedes into a distant year What can we bear to refuse Inside these postmodern blues
Yeah. Okay. So you wrote that last night, right? <laughs> I don't want to like throw you out there and let. I could have played it better if I had a couple other days to practice it. <laughs> that was really well done, and there were so many words. You definitely. I mean, I wrote the music. I wrote the music. I started. I started with a tune of just like da 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 and I was like, how can I get all these words out? And I felt like I was writing something that's already been written a million times. And then I, you know, put it through my filter of how I write things, I guess. And I was thinking how all of us songwriters, like we all read something and then as you know, a lot of us have been doing these together for a while and we can hear I can hear like the Stacy filter, the Elena filter, the Molly filter. You know, it's like, um, so that was that went through my filter, I guess. <laughs> like it's, anyway, yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, a lot of the words I wrote today, but I I wrote some of them. I mean, I basically started the song on Friday, and 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 on Saturday I felt like, wow, I'm already ahead of how I normally am because yeah, I started I start on Friday. <laughs> but I, I still I still want to finish the book. Like I'm I'm two thirds of uh, um through the book, and I I want I plan to finish it. <laughs> well, it's it's. It's definitely uh, worth finishing. <laughs> and then, you know, it's because then you, you read about the end. It's the end. Yeah, uh, you know, I was just wanted to say that, you know, the, with, when she when she fails to tell her friend, the, you know, and she doesn't tell her the truth, I, I, she could have lied by omission and not done another lie. But, you know, I forgave her for that because I could see that she was just desperate for some kind of privacy. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of understood that. Um, so that was Justine Cragen. And up next, we have another all new, brand new. I don't think she's done the, the Bushwick Book Club anywhere. I think this is her first time. Uh, her name is, I want to make sure I say it right, Renelle Labiche. Renelle Labiche, you are on. Hello, can you hear me? Thank you. Um, this is probably the first live performance I've done in over a year, and I can definitely tell like my hands are like sweaty and shaking, and my heart's like. <laughs> um, thank you, Christine. I really enjoyed the book. Um, I took my inspiration from the last three pages of the book. I really liked the ideas surrounding uh, the beginning and the end and kind of the philosophy around that and finding meaning but not finding meaning and just it just really kind of encompasses my daily struggle of meaning so um that's where the inspiration of my song comes from and uh, with that i will get started <laughs> my 
my mind are bleeding like the words in this book I just read. songwriters. I mean, Rennell, that was beautiful. I know, I think you might have been a little nervous that you wouldn't get it completed in time when you started the process at the beginning of the month. I think you started like a weekend to everybody else having started, but I mean, that's kind of the fun of it is you have this pressure that just pushes you to get it done. And that was gorgeous. So thank you so much. That was Rennell Labiche. Uh, she's new and I hope that she comes back again. Um, so we are going to bring Christine Smallwood back on to read from her book. Again, I'm so thankful to have you here, Christine, and I can't wait to hear what you've chosen to read. Hi, um, thank you. Um, again, thanks to all the performers. This is just such a wonderful and cool thing that's how I kind of can't really even take it in. <laughs> um, and I just really appreciate how uh, deeply you've all thought about the book and it's so cool to sort of pass it on and see like what people do in their own medium. So I'm going to read a little bit uh, from uh, towards the end of the book. It's the scene where uh, Dorothy does karaoke at a party at her best friend Gabby's apartment. Um, so I think all you really need to know about this um, is that Raj is Dorothy's boyfriend and that Gabby is Dorothy's friend. And um. I'm just gonna start reading. I'm gonna read for about five minutes. Around midnight, Raj nudged Dorothy and cocked his head. Gabby was hauling out a karaoke machine. The sight of the machine filled Dorothy with dread. Shit, she said. For a long time, she had loved karaoke. Honestly, she had loved it too much. 
The love was frantic, but also complex, a complexity born of her desire to expose herself and be known and her concomitant dread of exposing herself and being known. Of all the forms this conflict had ever taken in her life, karaoke was the purest. Do you want to leave while we still can? Raj asked. Yes, Dorothy said, but I think it's too late. Gabby was plugging wires into the TV with calm efficiency, a modern day Hans Kastorp running the gramophone in the sanitarium salon. They used to do it in private rooms. At first it had all been so new and enchanting, the sticky darkness, the bizarre accompanying videos about which someone always had something to say, the caterwauling audible from inside the bathroom when the nights other people were passing in other private rooms leaked into your own, and all this inside the dark and deep alcohol cocoon. Inside this cocoon, her voice was so good, so strong. It was amplified and loud enough to fill her head. Her friends and their friends were so beautiful. She could see their souls shining. It was an unbearable burden to love them so much. The problem with karaoke in those years was that it was so hard for it to end. And sometimes depending on what kind of liquor she was drinking in the later slash earlier hours of the morning, Dorothy became morose or fell into a funk as dark and soft as dirt. She might rouse herself out of it if someone encouraged her to sing again, or she might keep falling if someone started to sing a melancholy song. There was a variety of funk that Dorothy liked settling into, aided by nostalgic songs, when she felt the fragility of her ebbing youth and the sweet ache of pleasure she had known or missed. There was another funk that was loneliness and grief, and sometimes these two funks blended together into an overpowering pang of life and death in which Dorothy experienced the smallness of her being knit into the large, incomprehensible whole of everything else. Great passions were expressed and mourned. She would come home wound up like a clock, pulsing with all the songs sung and unsung, running on anxiety and regret, amped up and disappointed, wanting more and also wanting to have had much less. And that too was part of the love the bitterness that it did not last. Some time ago, karaoke had stopped being fun and then it had become a chore and then a kind of poison that caused Dorothy's internal organs to shut down one by one, but still she did it. Sometimes it was even her idea. It was hard to stop doing something you had once liked doing. There always seemed to be the possibility you could like it again, could be the person you had been who was now a stranger. Gabby handed Dorothy the second microphone and put on an emotive ballad from their parents' youth. It was way too early to go full throttle, full throttle on this kind of thing, but it was part of Gabby's charm that she never took the temperature of the room. Everyone else was engaged in crosstalk or looking at their phones or worse, a few people were staring at them, their heads idly nodding, offering half smiles of polite encouragement. Dorothy felt that they were all prisoners together, but of what she couldn't say, the dictate to enjoy, Nostalgia for a time they had never known, the obligation to please the hostess, their own mortality, their parents' mortality. Gabby told Dorothy to stay up for the second number. It started loud and fast and high, and from the excitement in the room, Dorothy gathered that this was a new song from a teen star that everyone except her had heard dozens of times and liked for reasons whose irony and sincerity could not be teased apart. Dorothy quickly passed the microphone to someone else. I've never heard this song before, she shouted to Gabby, who was already belting the chorus. Listening to Gabby, Dorothy felt herself expanding and also felt the reflected glow of nobility that always attended the admiration of a friend. Love for someone else's karaoke performance was greater and more intense than love for a great song because it was love for the person singing. Karaoke involved destroying something significant and putting oneself into the place of the thing you had killed. Beautiful singing took you somewhere, transported you in a reverie, but it took you back to yourself. That was why people cried when they listened to beautiful music. Amateurism kept the focus on the amateur. It was about appreciating the artist, not the art. Karaoke doubled the song. Even when you didn't know the original song, you never heard just the version that was present. You were always aware of another version, a real version, a ghost version, to which the current version existed in relation. That was the pathos of karaoke. It was a way of striving, an imitation not in the cheap sense, but in the sense of the meaning that attends an imitation of God. There were, of course, people who put on joke songs and tried to distance themselves from the power. And Dorothy always felt sorry for them. We are all in the gutter, she always wanted to tell them. But some of us are looking at the stars. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yo! Yeah.
pick for this show. I, that's one of the, the passages that stuck out to me because I'm on the opposite side that Dorothy hits of karaoke. I don't know if I ever felt the cocoon that she felt and how much she loved it, but I get major anxiety. So when Gabby's plugging those chords in and that whole scene, I was like, oh God, karaoke's happening. <laughs> so that description of the insides tightening. And people just stick because I'm a singer, people are like, oh, you must love it. I'm like, no, there, I don't know. I get mass amounts of fear and anxiety every time someone says, let's go do karaoke. I'm like, I love watching other people do it. And, uh, but what a, and such beautiful writing. I mean, just being able to describe all of that the way you do and it, it put words to things that I feel. So thank you so much for reading that passage and for this whole book and for being here. Um, so next we have Nicole Tortolo. Hi, <laughs> that was a beautiful reading, Christine. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm not gonna preamble. I'm just gonna play my song. Some blues are indigo, some blues are gray, some blues last for a lifetime, some lift in a day, some blues will make you angry, some fill you with dread. Blues I've had for a while come with streaks of red. Sitting in the library waiting for my therapist to call. I'm in the single occupancy waiting on that. But then I let it go to voicemail I don't feel like talking much at all I pay that nice lady to tell my troubles too I pay that nice lady to tell my troubles too But lately my troubles been with the truth Yes, and I think uh, Susan, who's doing our um, 
our tech stuff, she she mentioned that because Nicole used to do uh, Bushwick Book Club in uh, New York. So they know each other and she was like, I miss that honey voice. And when she said the word honey, I was like, oh, it's a perfect description of your voice. It is, it's so smooth. It's perfect for the blues. So thank you so much, Nicole Tortolo. Uh, up next is Tim Bartlett. And he always does fantastic things with lots of knobs and buttons and musical adaptations. Yes. <laughs> yes, I um basically I'm I'm I don't uh write songs with words for the most part. Um I look for uh some theme and try to put that into the the music and this just a explanation of what all these knobs and wires are. Um it's a modular synthesizer, so it's basically each module does one particular thing and like the book, you put put all the different parts together and so this this does one thing, this does another and you patch them together and so um Instead of calling it a song or a composition or a piece, it's usually called a patch. So the way that these are put together is um, is hopefully will tell tell some story or convey something. And this book, um, I mean, I, I loved it. It had so many, like there were so many themes and so many ideas um, that that I really loved. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that one. You know, the sort of the the never ending. Or I really liked the the thought of how the ending. There isn't just an end. How endings just sort of keep going and you never know. I, I mean, that's, that's definitely something that I've, I've thought about. Um, and, but just in terms of the composition of the piece, I all like Molly, I sort of, I really, um, I liked the, the scene on the subway with the, when she's, um, she's reading the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which I actually have read a number of times just for fun, even though I'm not, I don't, I don't necessarily love it. I just keep reading it. I don't know. So, um, but the, the sort of, there are a lot of things that happened on the subway there, which I sort of, so like I've, I've had that moment on the subway, um, but basically you'll hear some subway in here, but um, there's a number of, a couple of themes that we'll be going in, but it's basically the, the, the recursive nature of, of her thoughts, how sort of there's an idea and then she sort of gets into it and it echoes and echoes and repeats and she sort of gets totally balled up in her, um, in her thinking um, and sort of removed from the, the present. But then she also comes back to the present and is also very in the present in certain ways. So anyway. I'm going to turn the microphone down and um
in that yeah that was really That's pretty cool harmonies and some dissonance i know i wanted to be in like an immersion one of those, <laughs> those immersions yes. where you have no sensory input but that <laughs> very opposite of the new york subways right <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much That's tim bartlett so we have one more performer for the evening i would like to welcome elena degliniuschenski <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, we've been friends for a long time, but you know, it's okay. I'll, I'll let you know later. It's a very difficult last name, you know, degli innocenti. It's like you have to smooth out that GL a little bit. Like, anyway, <laughs> I just want to say that every song uh, tonight was fantastic. In fact, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to remember mine. Um, we'll see. We shall see as soon as I as I start. Um, oh, that's what's happening here. Now you're gonna probably hear some reverb too, right? <laughs> one, yes, one microphone was was down. So anyway, um, so I'm the last one, and I just want to say that um, you all have already brought up some really good points about the book. So um, the only thing that I feel like I want to add about the song that I wrote is just that uh, the book kind of gave me permission to really unleash my doubtful mind. So I totally went for it, like big time. <laughs> um, and I tried to find some resolution to in my song. Um, so I didn't necessarily follow the book in that sense, but uh, you know, just for myself to just give me some peace of mind at the end of the song, otherwise, you know. Anyway, um, I think the song is called Dear Self, but it may just be a temporary uh, title. So. I shouldn't have gotten divorced. I should have children to put to bed. I shouldn't have so many loose ends in my head. Piles and piles of memories cheating on me They repeat, they repeat I should have lunch at 1.30, dinner at 8 Time for my workout and put some money away I should make time for being social, for being open and zen And repeat again People you didn't want to invite to your wedding I invited too many Thoughts in my head like the People you didn't want to invite to your wedding I invited too many Thoughts in my head I shouldn't be fearful I should spend time alone to see what I want I shouldn't believe that there's nobody else for me out in the world Cause everyone says there are too many fishes out in the sea And why shouldn't I believe it? I shouldn't speak without thinking first But I should act on instinct I'm supposed to be strong and also sweet and submissive Is that the curse of a woman who wants more than she's been? People you didn't want to invite at your wedding I invited too many thoughts in my head Like the people you didn't want to invite at your wedding I invited too many thoughts in my head Whoa. Better to swim naked with all that it is As if all my shoots were ribbons slipping away Slipping away 
slipping away, slipping away. And they're slipping away, and I softly say no, letting them go. Going astray, and they're slipping away, and I softly say no, letting them go. Going astray, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, just a perfect, gorgeous, emotional way to end this show. That's all of our songwriters. Thank you so much. <laughs> Again, I'm not going to hit the G and the L. Elena De Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is gorgeous. I'm so. This is this was the show, Life of the Mind. This was the book. Thank you, Christine Smallwood, for being here and sharing this book with us. Um, thank you, Nicole, for the interview. I want to thank also Hogarth Books. Hogarth Books sent us advanced copies of this book, and it was um, awesome to have a, a new book that nobody else had and read it and be inspired to write something. And I encourage you to, to go get this book because as you can see, it's, it's a great book. Um, I also want to thank you for being here and listening to all of our songs and hanging out. And I want to invite you to join us on our Instagram and Twitters, uh, LA Bushwick Book Club for most things and LA Bushwick Book on Twitter. And if you loved the show and you have some couple ones burning your pocket or your phone, you can Venmo us and donate to the show or contribute to our show. It costs money to, to stream stuff. <laughs> Just life costs money. So we'll usually we give that to the sound person. Today hopefully we can give some to Susan. Maybe throw some at MailChimp. You know, just anything. You anything you wish to give, we'll just throw it to all these streams that are asking for it and taking it. And last but not least, I want to bring all the songwriters back on for a final goodbye and say thank you to them and let you all know that our next book is Gold Diggers, let me see if I can get this name right, by Sanjana Sathya. Um, that's our next book. So I hope all of these songwriters will come back and join us. If you are a songwriter who is interested in joining us, you can email me at labushwickbookclub uh, at gmail.com. LA Bushwick Book Club is also our website. That's the name of that website. That concludes our show for today. Thank you so much and a round of applause to everybody. Casey. Thanks, Susan. Yes, thank you, thank you. Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Bravo. <laughs> thank you, Susan, for starting this whole thing. It must be pretty amazing to see it everywhere right now in Sweden, in Seattle, and like <laughs> and other places. All right, now I will say goodbye officially. Goodbye. <clears throat> Au revoir.